I call the member for Q. Yeah. Speaker, it is an honour to address this assembly as the eighth member for Q and to contribute to the address and reply to the Governor's speech on the opening of the 60th Parliament. I congratulate you on your re-election as Speaker. Q is a special place. In Robert Hoddle's 1837 survey of the Port Phillip district, the parish of Burundara encompassed what would become Q. Of course, Burundara comes from the Woiwurrung language of the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and means where the ground is thickly shaded. Then, as now, the description is apt. Q is known for its leafy streets, its beautiful parks and its shady trails, with the Yarra River winding along its northern and western borders. Q is known for its heritage homes, historic shopping precincts and vibrant local sporting and community organisations. From Q to Borwen, Deep Dean to Canterbury and Surrey Hills to Mont Elbert, the community spirit is inspiring. Q is home to more than 30 schools, known for educational excellence. It's no wonder that Q's residents are among the most highly educated in Victoria. Victoria is the most successful multicultural state in the country, and Q is no exception. Almost a quarter of Q's residents have Chinese heritage, and over 60% of residents have at least one parent born overseas. For so many of us then, those that have chosen Victoria as their home make up part of our own family histories. My own paternal grandmother, a Scottish orphan who served in the British Air Force in World War II, came to Australia in 1946 as a war bride having married an Australian airman. They came to Melbourne before settling in Mildura, where, after two daughters, my father Ron was born. Mum and Dad ensured that I was baptised into the three great faiths, the Catholic Church, the Liberal Party and the Collingwood Football Club. <laughs> Which two? <laughs> Speaker, Dad was, as the Deputy Premier and the member for Removal will call, the member for Bennettswood in this place. Dad was my first political hero. And while it might be said that I followed in Dad's footsteps as President of Monash Liberal Club, as Victorian Young Liberal State President, and now as a member of this Assembly, I've also carved out my own path. I grew up in Montelbert, attending Montelbert Primary and then to Strathcona Girls Grammar also the alma mater of the fourth member for Q, Prue Sybury. I studied arts and law at Monash University and was a Hansard Society scholar studying at the London School of Economics and interning at the House of Commons. I was proud to have been admitted as an Australian lawyer in the Supreme Court of Victoria. Speaker, I am fortunate to have two people present in the gallery this evening that I am proud to call my professional mentors and my good friends. The Honourable Josh Frydenberg is a man of integrity and immense ability. Josh is a loss to Australian public life, but I know he has more to offer. Josh has showed me that there is nothing that can replace hard work in this place. From the time we first met, Josh invested in my future, and I thank him and Amy for their support. I've spent the majority of my career in the private sector, from consulting on tax policy at KPMG to leading the policy team at the Business Council of Australia. I've had the privilege to work every day with many of Australia's most successful companies and our largest employers. I wouldn't be here today without the mentorship of Jennifer Westacott, who put her complete faith in me at the Business Council. We've been through a lot together, energy wars, COVID restrictions and industrial relations debates. Jennifer is a force and her intellect and leadership is only something I can aspire to. In the private sector, I've witnessed the combination of risk, talent, hard work and agility and the alertness required to take advantage of entrepreneurial opportunity. It is business that creates jobs, not government. It is business that invests in the new technologies to deliver for consumers and delivers returns to shareholders including every Victorian with a super account. It is business that has the capacity to unleash human potential. And so in this place, you will find me a champion of free enterprise. Of course, no business is perfect, but too often, lawmakers make the fatal conceit 
of comparing imperfect markets with perfect governments. The liberal idea, as the Honourable Dr David Kemp calls it, is the ideal of an individual's inherent and equal worth, and the belief that this entitles each person to the liberty to pursue their own course in life. The role of this place and the measure of its success is to what extent we lawmakers empower people to clarify and pursue their dreams. I join the Liberal Party because I strongly believe that individual freedom, free enterprise and limited responsible government under the rule of law is the best chance of securing prosperity for all Victorians. Historically, the success of the Liberal project in Australia can be attributed to the relatively high social, social trust in and integrity of our democratic institutions. But this cannot be taken for granted. It should concern honourable members that according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, a majority of Australians believe that governments are a dividing force in society and think that Australians lack the ability to have constructive debates. Recently, much has been said about integrity in politics. But integrity is more than a buzzword. Although bodies like IBAC and the Ombudsman play a crucial role, members of parliament cannot outsource integrity. What can we do about it? First, we can maintain the integrity of the proper role of parliament to carefully debate legislation and hold the executive to account. Each year, thousands of pages of legislation and regulations are added to the Victorian statute books. Members of Parliament must ensure that those pages have proper scrutiny. We need effective legislation, not just more of it. Second, we can maintain the integrity of this Parliament's sovereignty vis-à-vis -vis the Federal Parliament. In the 1891 Convention debate leading up to Federation, Samuel Griffiths, later the first Chief Justice of the High Court, envisioned that states are to continue as autonomous bodies, surrendering only so much of their powers as is necessary to the establishment of a general government to do for them collectively what they cannot do individually for themselves. This vision has been considerably compromised. Today, there is almost no area of policy that is left undisturbed by the federal government and that is to say nothing of the revenue disparity. Of course, the federal parliament rightly has authority which, over which state governments must respect and not, for example, enter into arrangements with foreign governments that undermine Australia's foreign security. A broken federation is a problem for integrity because it results in the constant blame game between Spring Street and Canberra. Integrity requires decision makers to both take the credit and wear the costs of policy outcomes. Third, we can maintain the integrity of political parties. Our democracy is stronger when voters have a choice between credible parties of government offering comprehensive and values-based policy platforms to deal with real issues facing Victoria. Our democracy is weaker when some attempt to reduce the contest of ideas to riding the demographic wave of discontent. I was honoured to be the Liberal Party's candidate for Q at the 2022 Victorian election. My campaign for Q was a community campaign. We ran a campaign based on a simple approach, listening to the community and earning their trust. This is my ongoing commitment, to listen, to act and to get things done for the people of Q. Mm -hmm. Ultimately though, 2022 turned out to be a confronting year for the Liberal Party. There is no point denying that we have a lot of work to do at both a state and federal level. But the values of liberalism and the liberal idea remain relevant to each new generation. For those of us on this side of the house, the task is to translate those timeless principles into concrete policies that will have a meaningful impact on people's abilities to realise their own dreams. Speaker, in being elected to this place, I had the privilege of being named Shadow Minister for Finance, for Economic Reform and Regulation, and for Home Ownership and Housing Affordability. On finance and the economy, it is concerning that recent Hilda survey data 
shows that financial literacy is in decline across all age groups, and most notably amongst people under 35 and women. Many important economic decisions are made early in our adult lives, and so this must improve. Financial literacy is not limited to understanding household budgets. The Victorian budget is in record debt at a time where magic pudding economics has pierced the psyche of younger generations. Improving financial literacy will be a priority for me. On housing affordability, it is concerning that the rate of home ownership has been in decline for decades, especially amongst younger Victorians. It is not because Victorians no longer want their own piece of the Australian dream. Home ownership gives individuals and families a stake in their future and in their community. I know how difficult it is for my peers in their late 20s and 30s, working hard, saving for a deposit, being outbid at auctions and being hit with stamp duty as almost a second deposit. Victoria is addicted to property taxes, with 42% of Victoria's total taxation coming from land tax and stamp duty alone. I also know the challenges that industry faces with rising costs, supply shortages and planning delays. A principles-based approach is sorely needed, prioritising home ownership, choice, tax reform and sensible planning reform to unlock supply. Speaker, let me also say something on climate action, an issue which is important to me and the community in Kew. I spent the last five years working in energy and climate policy. I've helped to bring large businesses to the table to develop a policy agenda and work out solutions to achieving a net zero economy. We have seen an incredible acceleration in the transition over a short time. But we must be honest and acknowledge it gets harder from here. The how we achieve the transition matters to Victorians' livelihoods. The transition must be a market-based approach, not through top-down regulation. Governments must taste the least cost, most efficient pathway, not the politically convenient. Honourable members will appreciate that anyone who finds themselves in this place has had help from many people. You forge many friends in the trenches. Chief amongst these are Senator James Patterson and Lydia Patterson. True friends and political allies in that order. Aaron and I would not be where we are today without their friendship. To Caitlin Hardy, my campaign manager extraordinaire and loyal friend, wise beyond her years. In equal measures, she is compassionate and unflappable. The Liberal Party is lucky to have her and I will always have her back like she had mine. To Liana Fisher and Claire Gunning, two women who I can call at any time of the day and know that nothing will be too much to ask. I thank them for their energy and strength. To my new parliamentary colleagues, in particular, my friend and neighbour, the member for Hawthorne, the member for Sandringham, the member for Caulfield, along with those in the other place, Georgie Crozier, Dr Matt Bark and Evan Maholland. I'm also grateful for the wise counsel of my family friend and a former member in the other place, the Honourable Mark Birrell. I pay tribute to my campaign team of community volunteers, including Ben Jessup, Natalie Sterling, Anna Cairo, Dan Cronin, Emil Nicholson, Sarah Nicholson, Philip Healy, Lynn Robertson, Sue Leadler, Sam Ponsford, Nick Muraldaran, Simon Frost, Josh Worth, and Georges Angel. Speaker, our families are part volunteers and part conscripts. To my younger sister, Sarah, my biggest cheerleader, and to Rob, Henry, and Michelle, I thank them for all their love and support. I'm excited that at the next election, Henry will have a little brother or sister. To my mum, Jo. By election day, a too common refrain from Q residents was, I met your mum. <laughs> Others thought, to my great delight, that she was my younger sister. <laughs> mum is the energizer bunny. Door knocking, listening posts and pre-poll. Nothing was too much. But more than that, she made sure life continued throughout the campaign. To my dad, our family and friends often remark that I have my mother's looks, but I am my father's daughter. 
I only hope I can make him proud in this place. Finally, to my husband, Aaron, politics isn't easy at the best of times, but he has always been in my corner. My rock, the most decent person I know, and my constant source of advice, even though I might not always listen nor agree. I thank him for his unwavering love and support and for always putting me first. Speaker, I hope I'll be worthy of the trust my family, my friends, my party, and most importantly, the electors of Q have placed in me. Thank you.